I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, presidential elections are less than two months away in Egypt. Are the media there equipped or in the mood to cover the story? Journalists shot at in Pakistan, released by kidnappers in Syria, and warned by the prime minister in Turkey. 24-hour news on TV. All that airtime, but so little to say. Well, plenty more to come from here, of course. None of it news. Just add a beat and a little humor, and you've got rap news. Stand by as we tune into a dangerous frequency, mainstream TV. That's our web video of the week. When doing a story about the state of the news media in Egypt in 2014, it is difficult to know just where to start. The obvious news peg came this past week on the day Field Marshal Abdel Fattah al-Sisi officially left his army post to run in presidential elections next month. Or we could begin with the state-run Channel One, which on that same day aired a story about another candidate. That was deemed by other voices in the Egyptian media to be scandalous. Or there are the journalists in jail, including four from this network, as well as the cavalier use of terms like terrorists to describe them when all they admit to doing is reporting on the Muslim Brotherhood, a banned group that was the elected government less than one year ago. There's the lauding of Field Marshal al-Sisi as the nation's savior on TV channels that seem to be speaking with one voice, like something out of Egypt's past rather than the post-revolutionary country that those in Tahrir Square were promised after the fall of Hosni Mubarak. Our starting point this week is the media capital of the Arab world, Cairo. <laughs> لرئاسة جمهورية مصر العربية تأييدكم هو اللي حيمنحني هذا الشرف العظيم a sampling of news coverage in Egypt from privately owned channels, none of them run by the government. On the day Field Marshal Al Sisi made his candidacy official. Here's popular talk show host Amra Adi. The media coverage was overjoyed and over the top, but it had been that way for many months. I think there was this sense of relief because people had been waiting for so long. And uh, my family and I were, were debating which public affairs talk show host would burst into tears from joy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Will singing with joy suffice? This former belly dancer turned TV host found that her glee over CeCe's announcement was just beyond her ability to contain. <laughs> There are two narratives that have paved the way in the media for Sisi's presidential run. The first one is a public order narrative. The second narrative is a narrative of national security, and that has to do with the Muslim Brotherhood being designated as a terrorist organization. The Egyptian media largely subservient have echoed this. When these two narratives meet, they create a, a perfect storm uh, for a strong man to be the leader of Egypt. It's a learning curve for not only for the Egyptian media, but also for this emerging democracy. Because Egypt is on its way to be democratic, and Egypt is crawling to become democratic. The democratic process is not built in few months or years, and people are trying hard to be passionate about what they believe in, and uh, especially they take Mr. Sisi as the man who will perform miracles, and this is also something uh, not very healthy. Another telling example of how things have changed in Egyptian journalism came that same night on the state-owned Channel One. State-owned media outlets in Egypt are like electronic weather vanes. They detect which way the political winds are blowing and support whoever is in power. But on March 26th, Channel One broadcast an extended piece on another presidential candidate, Hamdin Sabahi. The broadcaster was chastised for that on privately owned channels that have always claimed to be less deferential to power than their state-owned counterparts. Hamdin Sabahi was CC Oil and Trashoho, 
في التلفزيون المصري مستر احمد موسى از انجري ان ا فيري باشونيت واي ذات ذا ايجيبشن تلفزيون شود نوت هاف ايرد ذات كليب ات ذيس بارتيكولار تايم اند ذيس از سيسي شو تونايت از سيسي شو بات ذيس از ذا واي Uh, people in Egypt now express their views as a result of the state of polarization in the country. Everybody who watched this particular documentary, which was a few minutes, was shocked. Why now and why directly after Sisi's announcement? This is very easy to understand. Just like Sisi have learned from the mistakes of Mubarak and Morsi, he's just doing the same thing. He's trying to show us that everybody has an equal fear of appearing on state television. They just wanted to whitewash the way media is playing in Egypt. It could not possibly have been an accident. It means either one of two things. Either they're making a promise that they're going to play this fair, and this is a good sign, and this is how they intend to proceed going forward, or they're just getting this out of the way to neutralize any complaints, and they'll go right back to marginalizing and giving the lion's share of attention to Sisi, and they'll always be able to point to what they did on that first night. Our interview with Ashraf Khalil was done by Skype because for Al Jazeera, operating in Egypt these days presents real challenges. This past Monday, three Al Jazeera English journalists made another court appearance where their request for bail was denied. So correspondent Peter Gresta and producers Mohammed Fahmi and Bahar Mohammed will remain behind bars at least until their next hearing, April 10th. They are charged with colluding with what the interim government calls a terrorist group, the Muslim Brotherhood, a party Egyptians elected to govern them less than one year ago. Gresta, who's Australian and wasn't even based in Cairo, told the presiding judges, the idea that I have a connection with the Muslim Brotherhood is frankly preposterous. Why are they being treated this way? Because they are from Al Jazeera. Many of the official TV channels or the press will say that journalists from Al Jazeera or journalists from Iran or journalists from whoever, whichever country will come will always there for a particular foreign agenda. They just want one dialogue. You just want one particular narrative, and every Egyptian should always follow this narrative. Another voice, another different voice, will always be unacceptable. Even today, for instance, um, if you read Al-Ahram, um, one of the stories on the first page is the Minister of Endowments in Egypt asking that Al Jazeera should be uh, put on a list of um, institutions that support terrorism and claiming that Al Jazeera supports terrorism. So Al Jazeera has been so thoroughly demonized in Egypt that anything associated with it will be dealt with through a national security perspective as opposed to any kind of freedom of expression perspective. The attitude towards Al Jazeera in particular is, is very toxic and, and, and has been for months and months now, Al Jazeera is regarded as an ally of the Muslim Brotherhood. However, it must be noted that the head of the journalist syndicate was very active in defending the uh, three Jazeera journalists who are currently incarcerated on trial and has, and has worked uh, with some of the international correspondents to improve their prison conditions. So, so that's always worth noting. But it's not as though there's a chorus of on-air voices calling for the release of journalists in jail. That would stray from the narrative. The one being reinforced on television, that Egypt, a civilization that has survived 7,000 years of history, can now only be saved by one man, a man in a uniform. That's their narrative, and the Egyptian media are sticking to it. Our Global Village Voice is now on the journalism coming out of Egypt. I believe that the media in Egypt has always been biased, whether with the Muslim Brotherhood polishing their image or now with the military. And I think that despite the large number of news outlets in Egypt, the news content is so poor. The slightest attempt of getting that content to be better gets squeezed out or even shut down. <laughs> المصالح المباشرة وغير المباشرة لمالكي وسائل الإعلام في مصر ربما هذا يجيب إلى حد كبير على سؤال أسباب دعم الكثير من وسائل الإعلام للمرشح الرئاسي عبد الفتاح السيسي أن المصالح المباشرة لمالكي وسائل الإعلام من رجال أعمال هي بالتالي تقف خلف المرشح الرئاسي اللي يبدو في الوقت الحالي أنه هو يمثل الرجل, الرجل القوي في النظام 
Time now for listening post news bites. In Syria, six months after being abducted, two Spanish journalists have been freed, but the circumstances of their captivity and what led to their eventual release remain unclear. On March 30th, freelance photographer Ricardo Garcia Villanova and Javier Espinosa, the Middle East bureau chief for Spain's El Mundo newspaper, both returned to Madrid. The two were taken in September while trying to leave Syria via the border town of Tal Abyad. Their captors have been identified as members of the Islamic State of Iraq. Initially, El Mundo kept their kidnapping under wraps. And in a press conference after their release, the pair said they could not provide details of their ordeal, how they came to be freed, or whether any ransom was paid. Syria remains the most dangerous place in the world to be a reporter, according to research by the New York-based Committee to Protect Journalists. At least 53 media workers were kidnapped there last year. Sounds like it's payback time in Turkey after Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan's AK party won most of the March 30th local elections. Bakın. In a speech right after the vote, Erdogan vowed revenge on his hidden enemies, including those in the Gulen movement and in the news media. We will enter their lair, he said. They will pay for this. They will pay the price. On the eve of the vote, Erdogan filed legal complaints against three journalists at today's Zaman, a newspaper with ties to Fatula Gulen a Muslim cleric and a political rival of the prime ministers. Among those named in the complaint are the paper's editor-in-chief, Bulent Kenesh, and columnist Mehmet Kamish. Both were accused of mocking Erdogan on Twitter. A third journalist linked to Zaman and to Gulen, columnist Emre Uslu, has also been slapped with a legal complaint. He's also facing a travel ban. The day before the election, a fourth journalist, Under Aytach, was arrested after he appeared on TV alleging that the Turkish government was planning a strike on Syria. An audio file of that meeting at the foreign ministry was later leaked online. Pakistan has seen yet another one of its more prominent journalists targeted, presumably, over his reporting. On March 28th, Raza Rumi, an editor with the Friday Times as well as a TV talk show host on Express News, was on his way home in Lahore when his car was sprayed with gunfire. Rumi and his bodyguard escaped with minor injuries. However, his driver was killed. Tweeting after the incident, Rumi said he had been dreading this day. It was the fifth attack against the Express Media Group over the past eight months, but the authorities in Pakistan have yet to make an arrest. Two months ago, three employees of the Express Tribune newspaper were shot dead in Karachi. The Pakistani Taliban claimed responsibility, accusing the news organization of spreading anti-Taliban propaganda. That attack led to the paper's editor, Kamal Siddiqui, issuing a new set of editorial guidelines saying that coverage of militant groups had to be toned down. Back in 1991, CNN made television news history with its coverage of the first Gulf War. The satellite age had arrived and it transformed television news. It took live coverage into the heart of a conflict and could devote 24 hours a day to it. All of a sudden, the idea of a scheduled news broadcast at 6 or 10 p.m. seemed outdated. Fast forward two decades and the satellite age has given way to the digital one. News junkies can now use social media and their mobile phones to feed their addictions instantly, faster and sometimes better than any TV news channel can. And the 24-hour format does have its flaws. There's too much opinion, not enough journalism, more talk than news gathering. Still, there are more news channels than ever as governments from Beijing to Moscow to Paris all realize that those channels can provide them with a soft power push. The Listening Post's Marcella Pizarro now on where the 24-hour TV news business finds itself today. The 24-hour news business depends on a fundamental premise, that news is always happening, that it's frequently breaking. But every once in a while, a story comes along that exposes that as a fallacy. A Boeing 777 is missing. They lost contact. Malaysian Airlines flight MH370 with two... Two weeks of excruciating airtime to fill. Press conference after press conference, but the information coming out is slow and scarce. It's very scarce indeed. Any further news? Um, no, there are very confused scenes here. In the absence of facts, one channel went whole hog and brought in a psychic. Well, naturally, I don't actually have hard concrete evidence, and I think any psychic who has hard concrete evidence can't do their job correctly because they get misinformed, they get um, interpreted, and they'll just, they'll just work on what they know. So I tend to work off what I don't know. It wasn't the highest point in what was once the iconic news innovation of the late 20th century. 
24-hour TV news came of age during the first Gulf War in 1991. CNN provided live coverage around the clock. Its impact on the news industry was dubbed the CNN effect. We CNN out of Atlanta in the United States, but then very quickly uh, more and more global channels followed. And suddenly news could be on air 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that meant there was no longer a daily news cycle that you had to sit down at a set time of day to find out what had happened. Suddenly news could be there day in, day out, at any time of the day or night. It's clear that when there's a big event, 24-7 News owns it, whether it's a war or a Katrina or the Tahrir Square protest. If there's a massive event, everybody goes to 24-7 News. So that's not their problem. Their problem is what do they do in between the big events? And the problem is in between the big events, on the whole, they don't have anything to say that's relevant to enough people's lives. That's the problem. So you want to tell me that all of this will vanish in a few years' time? I don't think so. Television as structured news bulletin, work of journalists, actually confirming of news, vetting of what is accurate or not, setting priorities and news agenda, making sense of the world, putting context together in one structured program will stay. You might receive it online. You might have a device at home which has television but has other things as well. But 24 hours news will continue for sure. Those sounding the death knell for 24-hour TV news say it's been technologically outpaced by the internet, journalistically outmoded by citizen journalism, economically outdated by social media industries. Social media has revolutionized how the public engage with news and information around the world. They can access it very quickly, it's very democratic, they can express their own opinions, they can share information between themselves, and if you like, get around the kind of media organizations that have traditionally been gatekeepers for news and information. That's why social media is so revolutionary, just as in their time, 24-hour news channels were revolutionary. The speed was the most important merit the 24-hour news channels had, but now it is really outpowered by the new media. And this media is very personalized. That gives the potential for the rise of the citizen journalism. They are equipped with the digital media and mobile uh, communication technologies, so they can actually get engaged with the event very, very easily. And then they can upload, uh, disseminate, and send it globally. Twitter and Facebook are indicators of news that's happening. Now, what people use really, they go to Twitter and they know that there is, for example, a coup d'etat somewhere. What is the next thing they do? They go to a website that they know, either television or radio or a newspaper which is structured, organizational, to make sense of what's happening. But when there's nothing happening, when news is not quote unquote breaking, that's when the cracks in the 24-7 news format really begin to show. Uh, well, plenty more to come from here, of course. None of it news. Last July, reporters from around the world camped outside a London hospital. It's game on. This is the moment that everyone's been waiting for. They were awaiting the birth of a royal baby. And behind me, the most watched doors in the world. One BBC reporter decided to tell it like it is. But until then, we're going to be speculating about this royal birth with no facts to hand at the moment. The only thing worse than speculation about a light and frothy news story is speculation about a serious one, like the Boston Marathon bombings. I'm told I want to be very careful about this because people get very sensitive when you say these things. I was told by one of these sources who was a law enforcement official uh, that this was a dark-skinned male. Trapped on air with few facts to hand, CNN's reporters broke a cardinal rule of live news. Never mind the race to be first, just make sure you get it right. Then there was that jarring moment on American cable channel MSNBC. A congresswoman speaking about the NSA surveillance program was cut off mid-sentence for news that just couldn't wait. Uh, not, uh, not continuing Congresswoman Section Harman, let me, let me interrupt you. Congresswoman, let me interrupt you just for a moment. We've got some breaking news out of Miami. Stand by, if you will. Right now in Miami, Justin Bieber has been arrested on a number of charges. The judge is reading the charges. Despite those kinds of shortcomings and competition on the web, the 24-hour TV news business remains a growth industry. Over the past decade, there have been a slew of new state-sponsored global channels. There's this one, funded by Qatar. There's France 24, which was launched when Jacques Chirac was president. 
Russia's Kremlin-backed RT, China's CCTV, and the BBC, who launched satellite channels in Arabic and Farsi with funding from the British Foreign Office. CCTV uh, recently uh, increased the investment on the uh, 24-hour news channels. Over the next hour, we will introduce you to China's new leader, Xi Jinping. So the way Chinese government would like to expand their soft power to create public opinion and improve the Chinese images through those uh, the channels, and they can control this media outlet. They have uh, increased the censorship of social media but at the same time, they increase the power of the mass media. Why would any country spend so much money on a network if it wasn't an extension of their national interests? Al Jazeera is, at its heart, an extension of Qatari foreign policy. That's the same, as they say, for Russia. It'll be the same for Telesur, for Venezuela, and CNN Spanish. If you want to have influence, you've got to be on TV. Because despite the flaws inherent to the format, the falling ratings, and all that fast-paced competition online, people still turn to 24-hour TV news, and they watch even stories like this one. More Global Village voices now on the future, if there is one, for 24-hour news on TV. No, I don't think that 24-hour cable news has become irrelevant or outmoded. In fact, I think they've done a very good job of embracing social media and the fast pace of Twitter. The downside to this is that sometimes events are reported on so quickly that we don't have all of the facts. I actually think we could benefit from slowing the news down a little bit before reporting on things. Do I think the 24-hour news channels are viable? No, not in their current form. I mean, I get it. You're in it for the money. You want to make sure that you get that ad revenue coming in. So you pick two or three stories out of the day that will not alienate your viewer base, and then you bring in experts to, you know, speculate about what they think actually happened at it. Why not just do a fluff piece on a dog show or something? Uh, go ahead. I won't mind as much. At least I have cute animals to look at. Finally, still with 24-hour news and the challenges it faces from new voices in the age of the Internet. Back in the early 90s, CNN didn't have to compete with outfits like Rap News, a satirical news broadcast from Australia that we featured before. In its latest offering, the rap crew collaborated with the Russian news channel RT after one of RT's anchors, Abby Martin, made news last month when she criticized President Putin over Crimea. It made news because the Kremlin pays for RT. But this video is not just about propaganda Russian style. Rap News also takes a run at the Western news media and their coverage of the showdown in Ukraine. This is called Crimea Media War Games, and we've made it our web video of the week. We'll see you next time at the listening post. Good evening, rap news is back through again, packing a fact-filled, truth-laden juice bulletin. Today we cross to Russia, where the world's eyes have duly been fixed, wondering who will win a confusing, brutal, crucial and ruthless struggle between sovereign states. Now let's move to the Western media for its take on this theme. Stand by as we tune in to a dangerous frequency, mainstream TV. Hey Rasputin, Russia invades Ukraine and threatens to start shooting. To explain the situation that's gotten very tense, we speak with Secretary of State John Kerry. Next, we need to remind those Ruskies and Putin's ass that we'll exploit all resources at our disposal, including gas. Sadly, Russians are so brainwashed by propaganda. They lack free speech laws and media standards, and they don't have open news networks like ours. Yeah, I bet they're pushing hard for war. Let's tune in for a sample. Get the camera started. Breaking the set live on RT, setting the record straight. This is Abby Martin. I roll with editorial control, and tonight I'm going to speak direct from my heart. Then what Russia did is wrong. Military force is never the better option. Who's this apparat chick using free speech on the Kremlin news? Abby, this is your president. Crimea humanitarian intervention is so good. I'm just telling it like I see it from my own view. Last I checked, that's what journalists were supposed to do. Well, that's about all the time we have left for inspecting this latest war that's raging. Not between military aggressors, but between their respective mass media weapons, which paint conflict as games of good against evil, when in fact both sides are often equally mistaken. Amid this frenzy in the media, one thing should remain clear. Lack of thinking on our part is the only true thing to fear. So until next broadcast, be sure to be critical of every new source that appears, including, of course, this one right here.